Hey, it's so great that no matter where you're watching from, or ever, whether you're here or you're in Leipzig later on, we are so happy to celebrate worship with you and service with you. And if you learned one thing in the last weeks, that nothing is normal anymore. So let's be living, let's be lively. So let all your neighbors know that you're watching services, give an amen for all the things. And I would like to tell you today what we will do the next weeks. And yeah, what I can say, we will have an online church for sure. And we hope that we have possibilities for reopening. But when we're honest, we have to look at the incidence um, numbers. So please have patience with us. And yeah, let us be flexible and look at our possibilities, opportunities. So we need a good hygiene um, program, for example, in Leipzig today, so we can welcome some people there. So we're happy about the hybrid churches here, where we have the online version. So if you're wondering who are all the people who are sitting here that are the co-workers of our church who are part of this here, so be patient with us. And we see um, yeah, that we have to be flexible and see how we go on here. So we're happy to have people here when you're switching, yeah, turning on your TV. And we believe that the word of God is not stopping at the screen. We believe that it's filling the whole room. So don't, um, don't wonder why there are people who say amen. And the Bible is telling us that you can through Jesus Christ everything is given to us and it's our yes and amen that we need for this so let's say yes and amen don't wonder about this because we believe the house of God is allowed to be alive so be alive hey we're in the middle of our um, series walk with me we're talking about discipleship and I believe this is a really personal topic because it's a topic that's about us it's a topic that we have to change in our lives. So does anyone experience any blessing in, from the last preachers? Write it in the chat. So we have to understand that discipleship is not a Christian word that we read in the Bible. It's a concept in the uh, kingdom of God. So we are made to be disciples and to follow God. This is what God wanted for us. He is calling us. He is not our, our Redeemer, not only our Redeemer. He didn't only come to be a Redeemer, but also to make disciples. And He is calling us to do more than just knowing him. He's calling us to devote ourselves. I know this is a tough topic. We talked about this in the first topic. So we, if you want to be part of church, if you want to yeah, accept this grace and this forgiveness that what God did for us, if you want to accept this, we reach out for something and take it. Who's thankful for all this, for the grace and for forgiveness? Come on. But at the moment where we decide to be disciples, we lay something down, we give something. This is why Matthew is um, stating this. Jesus says to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will found it. Hey, this is why we said this, the definition for discipleship is devotion. So in the first week, we looked at what does it mean to devote ourselves and to give something where, where we have to change to look to Jesus and where we change this perspective from what God did for us. Jesus gave everything. And from this perspective, we yeah, turn away from this and look to what can I give to Jesus? I want to give my life to, uh, to serve him. So what God has for you after the cross is so much more than what he has for you at the cross. The cross is so big, right? So we want to grow in this. So the question in this series isn't, is Jesus your dis uh, redeemer? But the question that I want to ask every week is, is he your Lord? Do you give the things to him? So the Great Commission, so in the Bible is in Matthew 28, 
And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the Great Commission. It's not a great suggestion, but a great commission. We are called so to give ourselves, to, to lay ourselves down and to be devoted and make people to disciples. So, last, so first we have to make disciples, then we have to mark them, so have this baptism, this um, public sign that they belong to Jesus, then we have to mature them. This means we help them to grow in discipleship. And this is our heart as a church. No matter if you're here at, in this location or if you're at home, we want to make people and help them to, yes, to get to know Jesus, make disciples. We want to help people to have this public um, declaration that they believe in Jesus that they confess their faith in public and that they can yes our tra that we can transform everything our our workplaces our marriages our neighborhoods because we believe in Jesus and as a church or this heart of this church we want to grow in the discipleship and in following Jesus and the Bible says we go from blessing to blessing. And what this means is that we grow in what God has prepared for us. Who is, is anybody in this house who wants to grow? Come on. This is why last week we looked um, at that discipleship means renewing. That's a difficult topic, right? We need renewing if we want to grow in Jesus. Because God is more interested in who you are rather than in what fruits you have. He's interested in what character you have. And last week we looked at how we can do this. And I want to encourage you to look at the other two series, other two preachers, if you haven't seen them yet. And I'm trying to see it like um, as an Avenger uh, um, series, so they are kind of connected, they have an order. So this is my, my hope that you watch them as well in an order. So let's pray. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for this day that you have made. It's a day of you, Lord. I ask you to... Um, to speak your words through all the TVs. I ask you to reach our hearts and touch our hearts, that we are ready to say yes and amen, that we are ready for more, that you take away all the things that are holding us back. We pray that you open us, that you take the spoken words and that you will fulfill it, that you put something in our hearts with this. We want to praise your name because you're the reason. And everybody says, Amen. Come on. Let's give a great clap offering for the Lord. Jesus says, walk with me. This is the title of this series. Because God wants us to follow him. So in other words, it means that we as um, disciples follow to follow his presence. So we need to look for the presence of God in our life. I like this example of Moses in the Old Testament. In 2 Moses um, 33, God says to Moses, Hey Moses, you can, go, you, you can go into the promised land. And Moses says, Yes, I walked through the whole desert. And now I can go. And God says, an angel will come with you and goes with you. And But God says, I will stay here. Because God was a little bit yeah, angry with the Israelites. And I love what Moses says at this moment. I want you to understand this because this is a, yeah, something in your heart. Moses says, if you don't go, I don't go. Because he says, who would I be without your presence? Who would I be? And he says, if you look at this, what would be different for me? What would set me apart if I wouldn't walk in your presence? So you have to understand, we need the presence of God in our lives. It's more important in our lives than things that we have to be done or that to fulfill our wishes. We have to be hungry for the presence of God as a, their disciples. 
to reach out for him and to put him first, to walk with him. So when we're honest, if you're really honest, hello church, honest, open, transparent, this is important for our church. When we're honest, how many areas are there in your life that where you go and God is not there. There is not the presence of God. Where you go without God, where you go without his presence, where you don't ask for his blessing. It's not like this that God said there, like, hey, stop, and had a stop sign for you. But he said, you can go this way, but I will stay here. I will stay here. And sometimes we walk into things that we really want, that feel so good and that are so important. So when I talk to people about this, I will, I will say, and I want to help people to grow. So I'm talking about things um, and we say, hey, maybe this is not the smartest thing to do. Uh, but the answer would be, hey, but this feels so good. Yes. Amen. Yes. Go for it. But let us look for the presence of God first. Because so fast, we change our ways, how we live in career, in relationships, in decisions, how we have a lifestyle. It's, we, can't, we concentrate on what, how good it feels instead of looking for the relationship and the presence of God. Because the presence of God should be more important than moving on. So we don't want God to follow us and to clean up after ourselves. So to be honest, right? And in my life, often God is just cleaning up after myself. I feel like this. And you're like, hey, oopsie. Well, I'm the only one, okay. <laughs> hey, we need, to God, we need to have God with us here. Don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean throw all away all your ideas, your dreams. The discipleship says this, yes, but we have a God who is alive, who is loving us, who sees you, who is walking with you daily, who let Jesus die for this so you can have a relationship to him. We don't have a distance judge somewhere up in heaven who is sitting there waiting for you to do something wrong so he can judge you. We have a God who loves you, who sees your heart, who sees your, um, your longings, and he knows the numbers of the hair on your head. We have a God, and you are so important to him. It's not about throwing away all your ideas and your hopes and your longings, but because he is so good, because he knows you so much and loves you so much, and because he talks about this, he says, I know what I have plans have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and the future. This is because he is so good, we should put our hopes and our ideas into him and give it to him, lay it down and then trust him that he is really so good that he knows our hearts. This means to be in his presence. So we bring what we have and say, God, you are good enough. You are good enough. And should I tell you something? I believe this is why we have to be rooted in the house of God. We need to be rooted there. Why? Because where we have there where we have our roots, this means like this will decide where we have our output. Where we have our roots. Okay, so we didn't see it here. Like the technicians are running around here. So this is why I'm laughing. So everybody's in here is thinking about what, what's happening here. So they actually took away the, cam the camera handy to know where I have to look at. So I'm just looking at any camera and say, hello. So we need to be rooted in the house of God. Because... The place where you rooted at will define how your fruit will look like. So the question here and for you at home would be, where are you rooted at? Where are your roots and in what are you rooted? Because we need this place of the house of God, this place of worship, of growth, 
of uh, purpose, community, devotion, and co-working. And especially in this corona season, this sh showed um, if you are rooted in the house of God or if you are just a participant watching. You can also be part of church by watching, but it's it's not about the buildings, about the people. It means, what do you bring to the table? Let us be in the house of God and yeah, come together, meet him and be changed and transformed and encouraged together. It doesn't matter if you do this here or from yeah, at home. It doesn't mean if C groups are happening at Zoom and I know we don't want to have this anymore. We want to yeah, touch each other and say hello. And we are a touching church, Martin Talaga says from time to time, because we like to hug each other and we ha like to have this community. We love community. But don't let us be lean, leaning back, but let us look for community and be rooted in church in this special season. Let us be rooted in the house of God. So this is what the team is doing here. Week by week, we try to bring a table and to build a table and with all the best things that we can have, with all the best technicians and the technical stuff and equipment, and the place where we can sit at and eat at, where we can get strength and be filled from God. The question is, what can you bring to the table? Let us not only build a table, let us bring people to the table, invite people to the table. So who are you bringing to the table? We don't only call to be disciples, but also to make disciples. Amen. I, I don't know how you feel, but I'm not satisfied with this. I want to have more disciples in this house. I want to have yeah, this possibility to reach more people. Let us invite people through living our faith and our beliefs to so make people to disciples, to become disciples. Through following him and reaching out for his presence, that we can help people through this to say the way of God. Last week I spoke about renewal and I know for some people this was an exciting topic. And for some of you, maybe you, you say like, ah, oh, it's not really my, not, not my topic. I, I think it's great how it is right now. I, I'm confident, I'm happy. I don't want to move much. No, I don't want to fight bangles. I don't want to dream bigger. I'm just satisfied. Yes, I want to tell you this is not bad. It's not it's not necessarily bad or wrong. But there's always a but, right? But God is calling you to follow Him and not to settle down. He wants you. He doesn't want you to settle and stay there. So let's look into the Old Testament. We look at the people of Israel. This is so important to me. We can be so fast, we can be so satisfied, right? And we can say, this is so good. The people of Israel, we know the story. They are in the slavery in Egypt. And Moses is coming on the burning. The burning bush is there, and then the ten plagues are there, and then they are released. And then they go. So they have to walk through the Red Sea. So what's, so what's separating them from going to the wilderness? So actually this going through the Red Sea is, um, is a picture for baptism. The baptism is the same thing. It's a symbol for, yeah, it's the symbol for stepping out of slavery and being redeemed and going out of the slavery of my past and start a new life. And the same thing like the, yeah, Egypt, the Egyptians were yeah, killed in the seas, the same way all your sins and everything that's behind you will be killed through the baptism. And you can be freely and walk on. So we see how they walk through the um, desert for 40 years. We see there a few um, difficult um, stories with you have a spice in the promised land. And then we see Moses is not allowed to go into the promised land because he had a problem with his emotions. He couldn't control his anger. Moses was called 
to go to a stone and speak to him and make water flow out of it. But instead of flowing of it, uh, speaking to him, he just, yeah, put his stick on it. And God says, okay, um, that's it. Don't let us follow our emotions and be our outbursting emotions, the reason why things um, break or that things don't happen because God has something greater for us. Let us follow God. So Moses died and Joshua is the leader now. So he is called um, by God um, to go with the people of Israel. So after Moses died, Joshua is called to bring the people of Israel across the Jordan. So Joshua told, tells the people, okay, everybody, get your things together. Um, yeah, take your chick wolfskin um, shoes and yeah, sharpen your knives. And he tells all the uh, tribes, in three days we start and take all the things you have, all your belongings, we don't come back. But there are two and a half tribes, the Rebanites and Gedites, and the half tribe of Manasseh. We look at this in Joshua 1, verse 10. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go and to take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. But the Rebanites, the Gedites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Jesus said, your wives, your children, and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you, east of Jordan, but all your fighting men, ready for battle, must cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites. You are to help them until the Lord gives them rest, as he, um, he has done for you, until they, took have, until they have taken possession of the land and the Lord your God has given them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land. So why do those tribes stay on the wrong side of the Jordan? Why is all this happening? After all the things they have been through, being released from slavery and seeing all the wonders of God. We need to understand before that, the two and the um, one uh, tribes didn't want to go into the promised land. They make a deal with Moses. They said, we have enough. We, we've fought enough. We, we waited enough. Let us stay here. Let us settle here. Let us stay on this side. And Moses said, we're allowing it because he wasn't allowed to go there as well. Or he tells us, the only deal is you have to fight for the, your brothers. So you have to fight for them on the other sides with them. So why do they settle? Why do they settle outside the promise of God? Outside of this, what God is giving to them. It's the same reason why we are, why we are often settling. Why we stand and stop and just stay. Because they said it's good enough. It's good enough there. It's how it is right now. This is good enough. I'm happy that I got this far. I'm happy that I accepted Jesus and that we have a relationship now. I'm happy that I can pay my um, bills and that I'm part of church, that I have a job and marriage and relationship. It's good enough for me. I don't want to bring more sacrifices, to, bring, uh, to fight more battles, to do more um, unknown things. And it's so hard to step into something unknown because we have no idea what will happen on the other side. And there's so many things and so many people here who say, I don't want to, I'm not sure if I want to go into discipleship because I don't know what's on the other side. But I want to tell you today, don't settle on the wrong side of the Jordan. Don't settle on the wrong side of the um, blessing because discipleship means devotional following, fellowship. Jesus wants us to follow him. He doesn't want us to hold on to the it's good enough. God is calling us for discipleship and not for it's good enough here. But what is how I'm living my relationship, it's good enough. How I'm living my marriage, it's good enough. My reading my Bible is good enough. My co working is good enough. The, my prayer life is good enough. My generosity is good enough. 
how I'm sharing the good news. It's good enough. And I'm honest, I'm, I'm lazy. I'm, and I, I can't fight anymore. I can't imagine it. That's why it's good enough. Mattis, I don't want to stand in for purity. I don't want to fight for things in my relationship. I don't want to trust in new ways. I don't want to allow him to change me. It's good enough. But if you stay in good enough, we miss the blessings that God has for us on the other side. I hear this so often. Martin, why do you want to start a new location? It's good enough, but we will miss the people who need to be led to God. But Martin, it's good enough. We don't want to fight to grow, but we are called to follow him to make people to be disciples. This is the good news that's changing everything. Don't let us hold on to good enough. Don't let us be too confident, too comfortable, too lazy. Let us follow him in every part of our lives. I know that um, this should be the relaxing preach because the other ones were so challenging. But I want to tell you, no matter where you are at now, God has more for you because this is the nature of God. It's in the nature of God to bless you, to give everything that you need to, to give you more. He wants to use it to, yeah, to conquer new lands, to conquer new cities, to break um, bad things and to be salt and light of this world. But Madis, this is good enough. I don't want. I want to tell you, don't settle on this side. Don't settle on this side if he has more blessing for you. And we see in this part that Joshua is say, telling them, um, the Rubenets, Gerats, and Manassi, you can stay here in the land that Moses gave you. This is really interesting because Moses was bitter because he wasn't allowed to go to the promised land. He was, was supposed to lead people, the people of Israel there, but he had yeah, anger issues before they were actually um, an official thing. So he missed this opportunity. So the person who is not allowed to go into the promised land says, oh, you don't have to go as well. So be careful so you don't live a life that is supported by people who don't follow... Um, the promises of God. There's so so often we see people around us who say it's it's not possible, it's not functioning or working like this. God won't do anything. This is how God is doing it now, or it's just normal, it's average, but it's not normal. It's not average, it's your normal, it's your average. But I believe that there is a promise of the, in the will of God. And I give my yes to this, to God's promise. Just because you can't see that God makes a difference, it doesn't mean that God won't do it in my life. It doesn't mean just because my parents couldn't see it, it doesn't mean I can't do it. Just because you can't see to the other side or go to the other side, doesn't mean I can't go. Just because you can't imagine that prayer and can break um, walls of a city and this, um, the word of God can go there, doesn't mean that it's also happening in my life. I will build my life in the promises of God, on the promises of God, not in yours. Follow Jesus and not your, your past and your ideas. This is a story of my Marine and me. So we go to Australia and people say, God doesn't want this. We build church in Leipzig. People say, it's impossible. You will fail. We start a Limbach and um, a campus in Limbach, Limbach and people say, you will fail. It's too much. We start a campus in Lub and people say, are you crazy? How can you still be going on? Just because you can't see it and maybe I also can't see it doesn't mean we won't go because I want to uh, follow Jesus and his promises. Is it possible that you are on the same, uh, on the wrong side of the Jordan and that you settle down on the wrong side of the Jordan? As followers of Jesus Christ, you have to be aware of who is around you. 
who is allowed to speak into your life. Joshua was aware of this. So Joshua decided who was allowed to sit at the campfire with him. Science said after the like 10 years after, so the 10 people who are around you for the next 10 years will have like an influence on the 10 to 15 percent of your character. Do you understand? We see this in our children's lives. Everybody who has children knows. Where did you learn this word? Where did you learn this? So I wouldn't allow my children to hang around with junkies in Leipzig because I don't want them to be a junkie. So this is the way, same thing for us. We have to look at who is around us and who do we allow to speak in our lives. So he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, do not be mis misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I want to tell you today, if you're around people who give, you will also be given. If you are around people who um, are in the word of God, you will be in the word of God. If you're around people who work in faith, walk in faith, you will also walk in faith and want, will want the same. I want to ask you, don't look for acceptance and for allowance and the wrong people, but in God and in people who follow God. And yes, they will tell you things that you won't like for the first moment. They will give you ideas and tips that you don't like because it's outside your comfort zone. You can't grow in your comfort zone because we often believe that God's promises will be there without any battles. We believe that good marriage and the blessed marriage and purity and discipleship, generosity, that all this comes without any battles and any challenges. And then we stop because it's just good enough. We believe it's good enough on this side of the Jordan. I want to tell you something. The battle will come anyways. The, the tribes of Reuben and the others had to fight anyways. I want to tell you what you have to understand, no matter what you do. Jesus says in John 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and it to the full. Jesus makes us to understand in the Bible that has that there's an enemy who is fighting against you and he wants to destroy you and he gets everything to makes you fall, who is taking away your hope, your vision, because he's so afraid of what you can tell the world when you're walking in the presence of God. And I want to tell you, you have to fight anyways, because... The battles will come. For example, the marriage. It's an example. And baby, I love you. Great. <laughs> okay, so. I'm, I'm sure that the biggest attack surface would be our marriage. Because if, we, yeah, if our marriage breaks, our ministry will break. If this will break, our service and everything, our family will, yeah, will break. So I don't want to just only have a good enough marriage. I want to fight for it so it will be the best with the promises of God in it, with his promises that I will have. I, will ha have, I want to tell you, you have to fight anyways. So don't settle on the wrong side of the Jordan. Fight for the best. Fight for the promises. And fight for this, what God has for you and wants to put in you. But the tribe said, we're tired uh, of waiting. And the danger is this. If you look at those tribes, we see how they say on this side of the Jordan and the others go into the promised land and conquer it. And they stay. They stay and say, it's, it's good enough, we settle here. Look at what they did. If you read, continue reading. Um, 
they built an altar on their side of the Jordan. Because why? Because they said, we don't want to cross the river all the time to pray to God. This is why we want to build an altar here. So this was the same altar that works in the Holy of Holies. It, it was an altar that had the same function. But, and the only difference was the presence of God wasn't on this altar on the side of the Jordan. They built a copy. They said this is for remembrance. So they said, they said it's a remembrance because they knew they can only remember what God did, so they can't really meet his presence. And the other says, like, say later in Mo Joshua 22, the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you. You Rubenites and Gadites, you have no share in the Lord. So, and all the people, you can't, they told them, you can't come here because your people would make our people not to follow God anymore because you decided how to worship God that you built your own altar in your comfort zone and with your own rules. So you're never in the positions where God is really praised and worshipped. We don't even want your children to come here so they can't teach our children the wrong things. And there are so many that are of us who are like this. We live outside the present, um, the promises for our lives. We are too tired to fight for them. We don't want to wait. We, we make our own fake altars, our own places of uh, worship. We remember. And here's the problem. As a disciple and follower, God is calling you to... Is, God is not calling you to be safe. But... He's not calling you to be in your comfort zone and follow your own wishes. He's calling you that you have a lifestyle that needs faith, that needs trust in God. When was the last time when you really needed faith? When was the last time where you had to make a decision and where you felt like Jesus wants a different thing and wants to change something in your life and wants to be you to be more generous? God wants different things for you. When was the last time where you knew for this decision I need God and I need to yeah, grow in faith? When was the last time when you were, had to make a decision where you were on your knees in order to find the presence of God in this area? When was the last time that you walked in faith and not in comfort and just in good enough? And yes, I know this means you're insecure. It also means maybe different people you were around with. It's a different way how you live, pe um, relationship, how you deal with money. Maybe Jesus tells you it's time to forgive them, although it, it was their, um, yeah, their problem. Don't let us be just happy or satisfied because God redeems you. And I understand if you say, yes, it was a hard battle to get here and to come out of slavery. It was a hard battle to finally feel peace. And it's a hard um, battle to... Yeah, to love God for three days in a row. And it was a hard fight that I can be here and be part of church and that I can pay my bills. But this, it's, I worked so hard for this. It's okay like this. But don't let us confuse satisfaction with complacency. God is calling us to follow him, follow him and for discipleship, not to be... And he wants us to follow him because he has blessing for us. Don't be just satisfied. Get more. He tells us, as long as you're breathing, I want to make you a disciple. And if there are things that you... Yeah, that you not sure about this. You should pray that God closes your eyes and lets you see. 
Ephesians yeah, 1, verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the rich of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. So we say, we, we pray, that God, open my heart, because I, God, I can't see what's on the other side. I'm so settled in my marriage, in my relationship, in the way I live. God, this is why I ask you to close my eyes and open my heart so I can see your promises. The second prayer would be, God, give me the strength for battle. Because if you want the promises of God, if you want to follow him, you, you need to learn to, fall, um, to fight for his battles. Psalm 18. It is God who arms me with strength and keeps me secure. He makes me feel like the feet of a deer. He causes me to stand on the heights. Okay, who wants to be like a deer? He trains me to hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You make your saving help my shield, and your right hand sustains me. Your help, me has me, your help has made me great. You provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give away. So, as a discipleship of God, you're not conquered, but you're the salt of the earth. You're the heir of God. Your disciple, your part of a kingly priesthood. This means God wants to use you wherever the way you go to build his kingdom, where you pray that this will be a place of pray. And God's ways for your life is, and for the battles means that we praise him, that we worship him, that we pray in a way that worships him and honors him. And the last prayer is, Jesus puts eternity into your life. He gives eternity. And how often do we settle in our lives because we don't have any perspectives? And because we're satisfied what we just have. So we're happy with what we have now, what satisfies us now. But if I want to live for Jesus, I live for eternity. Do you know? I'm not sure if you can imagine this the first day in heaven where you can see Jesus for the first time. And he, you say thank you for all the things he did for you. And you're full of worship and full of tears in your eyes. And Jesus is there, and you are there, and you're so happy. And sometimes I imagine how Jesus stands there and says, he is full of love. He, yeah, there, there won't be bad things in heaven. And he, he will ask you, how did you do? How, how was your part of serving? And what if, if I would have to say this part? Um, three words, not like for the locations would be, have, would have been enough for me. We did online church. Should I tell you what I'm afraid of? In this perspective of eternity. Why did you settle for less? What if Jesus says, why did you settle there? Why didn't you do more? There were so more locations, more people who needed my, my good news. There, there won't be judgment, but the eyes of Jesus will make you understand that this perspective of eternity is in you. And Jesus says, Matthias, I want you to be a disciple and make disciples. I don't want you to stay on this side of the Jordan, because on the other side, there are so many cities that need to be conquered. There are broken hearts. They're broken families and they need the good news. Why did you, Why did you settle? Should I tell you what my um, wish is? And my honestly, my most honest wish is that Jesus says to me, Yes, you made it. You let nobody down. You gave everything to build my, my kingdom. You, you took all the people who were 
you, who could have gone to hell. And yeah, he gives us, he tells us, all authority in heaven, yeah, make disciples and baptize them in the name of Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And Jesus is standing here and calls you to walk with me, be my disciple, make disciples, because this is worth it. It's, it's worth it that we don't just settle, that we yeah, don't stay in our comfort zone. It's, it's worth it that we feel pain that's um, challenging. Exhausting. You know why? Because God, be Jesus, before he went to the cross, didn't see the pain. He didn't see the pain that would come upon him when he was hanging on the cross. He didn't see how big the battle would be. He saw he, uh, he saw you and me on the other side. And he said, it's worth it. It's worth it that I cross here. It's worth it I pray, pay the price. And it's worth it I will stand here and say, it's done. It's worth for for Matthias Tillman, for Dominic, for Martin. It's worth it for the generations um, who will come so they can see their heavenly father. It's worth it. It's worth it to give into discipleship. So let's stop to be lazy and comfortable. Let us look for the presence of God. Let us get up for a moment. So, okay, so we're not allowed to sing here in this room, but you're allowed to sing at home in your living room. So, let us... Don't let us be too comfortable. Let us learn. There is a way how we fight our battles. Yeah. Let us learn that there is a way that how we fight our battles. Although we want comfort and we want, um, we don't want to fight battles, but we will fight. We will fight battles on our knees because where I, my knees. Um, hit the ground my battles will be won and this is how I fight my battles so let's sing how we fight our battles I'm not staying on this side of the Jordan Jesus I'm following you and this is how I fight my battles. I'm looking for your presence. It doesn't matter if I'm surrounded. Because it may look like Because I don't want to stay on this side of the Jordan. What, but no matter what's offered to me on this side, it's not as good as your presence. It's not as good as all the promises that you have for me. Because this is how I fight. And God, we stand here today, maybe in front of a Jordan, and we don't know what's on the other side. But we don't settle. Because you promises us that the, the doors of um, hell can't change what you have for us. And maybe you're here today. And maybe you never said yes to Jesus. Maybe you never took this invitation he has for you. 
and that you never stood in front of the cross where he says if you if you accept my name you will have eternal life you will walk in and blessings if you believe that I was resurrected and for everybody who is here and in the screens today at home if you're the one who wants to say I want to give my life to Jesus I want to go back because I have an inherited um, faith no matter where you are and who you are I want to invite you to get up I want to ask you to reach out for God and to say that's me that's me no matter who's there next to me on the couch it's a it's a sign of devotion I surrender I want to devote myself and I want your name Jesus in my life if, and if that's you I want to invite you to speak this prayer with me today to say yes to Jesus I'm praying and you will can just pray with us because we want to pray as a family. Let us pray, Heavenly Father, I come to you as a sinner. <laughs> I come to you as a sinner who needs a Redeemer because we need you, Jesus. I come to you as a sinner, sinner who needs a Redeemer. I hear your voice who is calling me, that's calling me to be your child. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe he lived a perfect life. I believe he died a sinner's death. I believe that he is resurrected again to give life to me. I put my faith in Jesus Christ I am forgiven. I am renewed. This is my new start in Jesus Christ. In His name. Amen. Amen. And here in this place, but also at home, let us raise a hallelujah with all you have. Let's raise a hallelujah.